And we're going to tell you a story about a discovery, we, a discovery we made on a bizarre behavior. And lastly, we're going to wind it up with a, with a story about the extraordinary beauty uh, and, a, and the great lengths that Tim had to go to to capture a sublime moment. <clears throat> this project really got started when I received an uh, assignment from National Geographic magazine back in uh, late 2003 to do one of my dream projects, which was to, to go to New Guinea and photograph the birds of paradise. And at that time, I, I started doing my, my background you know, research and figuring out who, could, who, who I could team up with. And I found that Ed was the only guy who was actually doing active field research at the time. He was in the you know, later stages of his PhD project using uh, this kind of what now looks like rather antiquated video technology <laughs> to uh, document birds of, birds of paradise, uh, display behavior. Uh, this was, like, yeah, it, um, so we teamed up to, to go into the field in, in 2004. Um, so that was quite a few years ago. It looks like he got a little gray hair since then. But, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, the reason that it worked so well to team up with Ed was that he had already had several years of experience working on birds of paradise. He knew how to find them. He knew their calls. He, when we got into a, a remote forest that we hadn't been to before, he could home in on the birds and, and find where they were displaying in, in really short order. So it was really key uh, for me as a, as a photographer, but without much experience in New Guinea, uh, to, uh, to, to, to hook up with Ed for this. So when I got the opportunity to work with Tim, the most amazing thing for me was that here's this incredible world-class photographer, but who also is a, a scientist who has been years studying the uh, ecology of fig trees and the canopy of Borneo. So Tim is an expert tree climber in addition to being a photographer. So all my years of studying birds of paradise, I've been studying the species that display on or near the ground. And as you know, many of them display high up in the canopy. So really, having Tim doing his work in the canopy and taking his big lenses up there and being able to see these birds through the eye of his lens uh, was an opening an incredible door for me and really speaks to the, the unique nature of our partnership and how we've been so successful. Many of the birds do display high in the canopy and this uh, red bird of paradise is a good example. Uh, I photographed this bird in, in, in one of our first trips in 2004. It was actually the highest tree that I had to climb this species likes to display on the tallest trees in the forest, and uh, I set my blind up 50 meters or 165 feet above the ground. I, I measured the height of it with one of my ropes, but that spot yielded uh, one of my, my favorite shots, which also ended up as the uh, opening spread of the 2007 uh, July issue of the Geographic, this story called Feathers of Seduction. That was the sort of the end of the first phase of this project. We spent five months in the field together uh, and photographed uh, close to half the species of birds of paradise during this first effort for this article in the geographic. Uh, and, and, and that's what kind of got us going. But we, we kind of decided at that point, like, hey, we don't really, maybe we don't want to stop here, you know? So it was somewhere probably uh, in a field camp, not unlike this one here, that we were sitting around the fire uh, eating a meal and we said, you know, hey, this is working out well. We're, we seem to have done pretty good. Maybe we should try to document all 39 species. And uh, so then the, the plan was hatched. We had a vague idea that we were going to try to turn it into a, into a book or something like that. We didn't know how we were going to fund it at the time, but we, but we set out to, to try to accomplish that goal. Now, of course, in order to do that, we had to go everywhere that all the birds of paradise are found. And all 39 of them are distributed in a small corner of the globe, but quite widely throughout that area. So we had to go from the islands like you see up there on the far left, Ahalmahera in the, uh, near the Spice Islands, all the way through the main island of New Guinea, everywhere that's orange is the range of birds of paradise, and even down into Australia where the southernmost species live. This was the full, full range that we had to cover. And so to give you a little sense of what that effort was like and uh, some of the milestones of the project, we're going to play for you a short um, video piece that was put together uh, by the Lab of Ornithology, our colleagues there in multimedia, to give you a little sense of this effort and what, what's behind it.
As you saw there, I took, took a total, I brought home a total of over 39,000 photographs. Uh, I don't think I have time to show them all to you today, so <laughs> made a bit of a selection. But uh, as, you, as you saw, we, we kind of took almost every kind of transportation imaginable to travel all over this region. Uh, and I'll, we, one of the spectacular aspects of this project was getting to see all these parts of New Guinea, like Gam Island here. This is actually an island that has Red Birds of Paradise on it, right along that ridge over there was a display site we checked out. We got to go up to the high mountains along the central range uh, in this area of Lake Habema to, to, ch to look for the uh, splendid Astrapia up above 11,000 feet. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the lowland rainforests in many different sites going after the lowland species. And we spent a lot of time in, uh, the, cl in the cloud forest or the montane rainforest, which actually is the area where the, the greatest number of birds of paradise are concentrated. But we had to visit many different mountain ranges because many of these 39 species are found, you know, restricted to certain parts of, of New Guinea and certain mountains. mountains. But uh, in the end, uh, in late 2011, uh, we reached our goal of photographing every species in the wild for the first time. And uh, you can see them on this little uh, uh, grouping here. Uh, but uh, this was, uh, you know, the culmination of this eight years of effort. Uh, and we're going to today go on to sort of go into a little bit more depth on a couple of these, couple of these species. So this brings us to the first section uh, where we're going to talk to you about some examples of extreme evolution in the birds of paradise. So even though Tim tried and tried to get a picture of one member of each of the 15 genera of birds of paradise all nicely lined up on a branch for him so we could see <laughs> the great diversity in, in size and shape and color, it didn't quite work out that way, so uh, fortunately we had a tremendous uh, illustrator at National Geographic who made this for um, our book. It's also going to be in National Geographic magazine. But one thing that's really important to point out here is that these are all drawn uh, to size, so you can get some relative sense of scale. And there's, a, there's also a pigeon down in the lower right-hand corner there, which is something you're probably all much more familiar with, so you get a sense of the size diversity. So birds of paradise are a family of birds. And they're all more closely related to each other than they are to any other birds in the world. So there's one family found in this one part of the world. And we zoom into this picture here. You get a really good sense by looking at these two on the right, the greater bird of uh, on the left, the greater bird of paradise, and the Wilson's bird of paradise, one of the largest and one of the smallest. And you can see not just how different they are in, in size, but also in color and shape. If we slide over here to the other side of the family tree, there's a couple other Im important things. <clears throat> Number one, if you look, at the, at the far right side, you'll notice that some of those birds of paradise aren't nearly as colorful. They're actually more crow-like. And these are the, this is the first branch off the bird of paradise family tree. And they're actually much more closely related to the group of birds that's much more familiar to us, um, which are the crows and shrikes and jays, things in the, in that we know of in the family corvidae. Well, birds of paradise are part of this greater, greater uh, corvid group. In some ways, you might think of birds of paradise as being glorified crows. Um, <laughs> Everything we've seen here uh, on this is an example of a male bird of paradise, but this is what a female bird of paradise looks like. This is a female uh, paradise rifle bird uh, from outside Brisbane, Australia, one of those southern, southernmost species. And uh, I'm going to tell you a few really important things about bird of paradise biology here, a little bit of bird of paradise 101. So all, all, all bird of paradise females lay one egg, uh, typically, occasionally two, and they do all of the parental care themselves. So the males play no role in parental care. They're basically courtship and display and mating machines. Um, so they're, they're not like the scrub jays that Fitz, Fitz talked about. They definitely don't have those same family values. But that's not necessarily the case in that first offshoot of the, of the Birds of Paradise family tree. This is a curl-crested manicode, one of the more crow-like members of the, of the family. You can see there's two chicks in there, and in this case, the males and females look the same, so they're not sexually dimorphic, and they both uh, attend to the nest and provide parental care to the chicks. So they are kind of more like those, those other um, uh, uh, crow-like members of, the, of their group. Birds of Paradise are 
are interesting because they, they like a lot of uh, crow-like birds, they're omnivorous, they'll eat insects, they'll even eat small vertebrates, but they're, they're unique in that they are mostly frugivorous, that is, they mostly eat fruit. And uh, here's an example of a female um, there on the right of a ribbon-tailed astrapia on this Schefflera fruit, and you'll see that she's uh, feeding a begging full-grown chick uh, who's fully capable of taking care of himself. I'm pretty sure it's a young male. So there's this kind of strange extended period of parental care because they're only reared in this one, one chick a year, and then she'll go on and, and uh, find a, a mate for the next season. So the really important thing about female birds of paradise on this story is that they call the evolutionary shots. So this is a courtship display territory of a male Corolla's parodia here. You can see him on his court, and we'll talk about that in a little, little bit later. But you'll notice all the females there, the subtly brown ones at the top, they're there to watch him and be the arbiters of evolution, if you will. So you, you probably are familiar with natural selection, <clears throat> which is a process where uh, individuals vary in different traits that, um, <clears throat> that make them um, better able or less able to survive in their natural habitat and the natural world, the environment, selects for the ones that are going to pass on their genes to the next generation. Well, in, in Birds of Paradise and other groups of birds that have this kind of breeding system, there's this thing called sexual selection that's going on. And in fact, it's the females of the species in Birds of Paradise who are playing the primary evolutionary role of selecting which males are going to contribute the most to the next generation. So if you think of natural selection as survival of the fittest, we've heard that before, you might think of sexual selection as survival of the sexiest. <laughs> so we're calling this 39 ways to woo your lover, because there's a lot of diversity in the ways that male birds of paradise uh, do that for the females. Uh, we're not going to show you all 39. Uh, but you might stick out your back, Jack. Um, <laughs> 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 this is a male. Raggy on a bird of paradise, uh, and you can see those incredible um, red feathers of the flanks that he's lifted up and spreading behind his back as he's kind of going inverted there. And this is one of those examples of this extreme evolution in color and shape and form of these feathers and behavior. One of the species that I was really excited to, to see and most wanted to see when I first started this project was this species, the Wilson's bird of paradise, which we went to film in Batanta Island. This is one of the species that, that clears a court. He doesn't actually display right on the ground. He displays on a, one of those small vertical saplings. But uh, he comes down every day to, to clean the court, throw off any leaves that fell down during the night, and uh, keep it very neat. One of the most unique features of the Wilson's Bird of Paradise is this blue skull cap. His, his head actually is, uh, these blue areas are bare skin uh, that have this color tone. And he also has this, you know, this bright red and yellow, the curly Q tail. Uh, another member of the same genus is the King Bird of Paradise, which also has these two central tail feathers modified into these very unusual ornaments which look like two little green discs at the end of these wires that bounce around and sort of accentuated by the, the bright red plumage and the blue feet. Makes for quite a striking color combination. Another one of my favorites is just the amazingly colored bluebird of paradise that you see here. But the <coughs> birds are not the only uh, colorful things that we met in New Guinea. The people are also very colorful and this was actually a villager from the Western Highlands who uh, was participating in a village ceremony that we just happened upon one day, but uh, I'd like you to notice what he's wearing in his nose there. So this is actually the true owner of those feathers. This is the male king of Saxony, Bird of Paradise, and uh, he has those two feathers growing out from the sides and top of his head just above and behind each eye. And these are an example of some of the most extreme feathers in the entire world, and they've evolved for no other purpose than to be attractive to females. They don't serve any other, any other, any other function. Male King of Saxony spent a lot of time on top of snags like this or high perches up in the canopy overlooking their, their territory, and they vocalize, trying to attract females near to where their courtship display site is. And when the females come, they fly down into the forest understory where they perform their courtship on a vine, in a sea of vines throughout the uh, cloud forest at the high elevations where they occur. You can take a look at that here.
So not only do they look pretty incredible, they also sound quite amazing as well. <laughs> so there you can get a really good sense of the, the shape and texture of those, of those uh, wonderful feathers coming off the top of his head. It's a, it definitely is one of the best examples of extreme evolution in the birds of paradise. Another really strange one is this species, the 12-wired the bird of paradise, which lives down in the lowland swamp forests, where it's always, we're always getting our feet wet just to get to the trees where these birds are. But they like to display on top of a pole. You may have noticed that each species has a very characteristic dis display position, whether it's a vine like the King of Saxony, the ground, or in this case, the top of a broken off pole. And the 12-wire Bird of Paradise gets his name from these very unusual feathers that you see coming out of his uh, backside here. It looks like it's coming out of his backside, but actually those aren't, his, those aren't coming from his tail. His tail is actually the, the, the you can see it, it's black, and it's the, uh, you can see the feathers of the tail just on the right there. Those yellow plumes are coming from his sides, and 12 of those yellow feathers have these special extensions, a sort of central rib of the feather that doesn't have any, any you know, barbs on it that is just this long, wire-like extension that gives the bird its name. But, you know, first you have to wonder, like, what are these wires for, right? In the early morning, 12-wire male comes and starts calling from his perch, and hey, a female's shown up, showing a bit of interest, so look what he does. He, he turns around and he, he starts brushing these wires past her. So, for some reason, you know, female 12 wire birds of paradise seem to like this kind of uh, approach <laughs> to uh, <laughs> courtship. And what I find really interesting is uh, being able to combine the video with the still photography that we've been doing recently. Is, you know, in the video, you see that kind of wire brushing behavior go by really quickly. You can't see exactly what happened. You take a still photograph, you can, you can zoom right in and you can see exactly what's going on, like you can see the wire brushing right up against the, the female's neck. So it's about touch in that species as much as it is as behavior and yeah. color, which is really incredible, or sound for that matter. So now we're going to move back from the lowlands up into the, uh, the cloud forest high in the mountains of New Guinea again and look at a few examples of uh, some extreme evolution there. This is a splendid astrapia. Uh, this is one of the most intensely iridescent of all the birds of paradise and frankly of all, of all birds. Iridescence is that metallic shimmery color that you see. If you were looking at this bird from afar, you know, even if you're a bird watcher, it would mostly look black. But when you catch them in the right light at a, at a close distance, not unlike the way that females see them prior to, to courtship, you can see this incredible shimmering color like Tim was able to capture here at this male feeding. Another uh, thing about these astrapias, these birds of the, of the high elevation forest, is they all, a lot of them, uh, most of them, have very long tails in addition to the iridescent colors. This is a, a male hue on astrapia, also on a ship layer fruit. And this guy has the same amazing iridescent color and this funny pom-pom tuft of feathers on his, above his, on his forehead there above his bill. But his called the ribbon tail astrapia, and he gets his name from the sheer magnitude uh, of the length of his tail. And here it is. These are the two central tail feathers dangling as he's perching there. These are the longest tail feathers relative to the size of a body of a bird of any bird in the world. They're over a, a, a yard long, a meter over a meter long. And this bird's about the size of a, of a chubby blue jay. Of course, you're probably wondering when they're just out and about doing their day-to-day -day thing, how they manage that tail. Uh, so here's one, again, foraging on the same kind of fruit. This genus likes the Schiffler fruits. Um, and it's what's incredible is we've seen them foraging on fruit, but also on, on mossy uh, vines where they're looking for insects. And as they're probing around, their tail is getting twisted around the vine. And on a couple of occasions, a male looks like he's getting ready to fly away, and he'll stop, look back to see where his tail is before he flies. And a few times we've seen him actually grab his tail and pull it out before he takes <laughs> off. So they're very aware. Here's another long-tailed bird. This is the <clears throat> brown sicklebill, the male brown sicklebill. <clears throat> and while his tail is quite amazing, even more amazing, and something that's uh, an example of some of the most extreme evolution in all the world is the sound that this species makes. I'm going to play for it here and see if you've ever heard a bird that sounds like this. To me, it sounds like nothing in the natural world. Uh, 
Some people say it sounds like a jackhammer or perhaps a machine gun. And in fact, during World War II, soldiers, as they were, uh, Japanese soldiers, as they were invading Port Moresby uh, through the mountains, apparently hit the decks when they thought the Allies were uh, firing at them from high in the mountains of New Guinea. And it was only the bird doing what he does every day. <clears throat> so many of the birds that we've been showing you so far are, you know, expressing their uh, colorful, you know, the colors are the big uh, attraction that, you know, is the most important part of their displays. Uh, but not all birds of paradise are that colorful. And among uh, one of the most, what I think is one of the most interesting groups are what we've come to call the sort of shapeshifters or transformers. These are mostly black birds of paradise, like this black sickle bill that you see here. And what they do is they transform into sort of otherworldly shapes. And here is a little video clip showing what this male black sickle bill does with these special feathers that he puts up around his head when he goes into the display posture. And so a female has come there to check him out. This is actually the first time uh, that I think anybody ever filmed uh, a female visit to a displaying sickle bill. So that was exciting to get and to see that she actually came right up to his perch there and gave him a very close looking over. But what's really amazing is that uh, this bird is transforming his shape as is part of his display and not using his wings. Those aren't his wings. Those are special feathers coming out from his kind of up shoulder area. Uh, that, that are lifted up around the head to form that, that big disc. And there are several species in this kind of shapeshifter or transformer group. One of our favorites also is the male superb bird of paradise. You can see he's, you know, pretty spectacular with that bright iridescent breast shield. That's not like feathers that we typically uh, see very often. But there's also some other things. He's mostly a black bird. He looks fairly recognizable bird-like, but he's got something going on on his back, hanging out there. Those aren't his wings. His wings are just folded closed. And that actually is an important part of this transformation. The male likes to display on a fallen log. A female's coming. He's pointing his breast up towards her. And here in a moment, he's going to tra transform himself from something bird-like into something otherworldly. Somebody once commented that, you know, this looks like a UFO or perhaps a psychedelic smiley face. <laughs> and you can see how the male, no matter where the female moves in response to him, he's always keeping her in the front. So she's seeing this shape that he's created out of his feathers. And he's made this illusion with these look, what look like eye spots on the top of his head, but those are actually just the feathers from his crown that he's created moving his, his bill up. You can see him, he's breathing there. It's hard work. You can see, I like to call this the uh, obscene, the behind the scenes here, where we can see all the individual feathers lined up. This is what the females don't get to see. Um, but like Mike said, the uh, courtship business is a, um, a difficult business, and most of them end uh, sadly for the males, even though they did such a great performance. And once again, the female here decided to uh, not choose him, this time at least. And this brings us to uh, part two, where we're going to take you on an expedition to our discovery about a bizarre behavior. <clears throat> so out of this whole island of New Guinea, uh, you can, it's a little hard to see on this screen, but there are yellow dots and places labeled all over this. We went to 51 different sites. You can see a big map of uh, this in the exhibit across the street. Uh, we're going to home in on the uh, Huon Peninsula over here in the north northeastern part of Papua New Guinea, where we went on a trip in, in late 2011. We started out in the town of Leh, where we, we flew to on a commercial flight, and our plan was to charter a, a bush plane to get dropped off at a remote airstrip up in those Sarawagat range there. But uh, when we got to Leh, we found out that the, the plane that we were supposed to fly in on had, had experienced a recent uh, landing difficulty at one of the airstrips. And, and uh, basically had crashed. So, so we had to go to, go to plan B and we, we found a, a helicopter that was available and started to get that organized. And we had some communication with uh, res uh, some researchers, uh, part of Bruce Beeler's team from Conservation International that had worked in uh, a place called the Sombom Camp where you see that upper star. And we were able to uh, ask uh, some villagers that were helping out there to clear an old garden to make a, a little landing area that we hoped would be suitable for, for this helicopter to land. So it was like a, a new, you know, a new helipad that nobody had ever landed at before. Uh, but that was the route that we were going to fly over the mountains. 
And so since we decided to use this helicopter, which we, you know, we don't do very often, uh, I decided to take advantage of the opportunity to document the, the flight in and attach one of my cameras below the uh, tail stinger of the helicopter. And of course, that's the part of the helicopter that, you know, if the, helicopter, if the pilot makes a rather bad landing, that's designed to hit the ground first uh, and protect the tail rotor. Um, but I guess that's, you know, I tell myself, well, that's what camera insurance is for. Uh, and so I attached my camera and uh, was able to create this little uh, time-lapse video of our flight uh, out of the town of Ley and heading into the mountains uh, toward, toward this uh, Samba area. Along the way, we, uh, it was early morning, we saw some beautiful mist. Of course, I also was photographing out the window of the helicopter at the same time, taking shots like that of the, the rainforest and the mist along the way. And uh, actually, on this trip, we had accompanying us uh, a uh, film crew from National Geographic Television. Uh, we also had a crew from Cornell, a uh, multimedia uh, group, accompany us on one previous expedition. And with those two uh, teams that came with us to document more of the expedition aspect, combined with uh, the work that Ed and I did filming the birds and also shooting each other in the field, uh, National Geographic Television has put together a, a one-hour documentary uh, about our project that's actually going to be airing on Thanksgiving uh, evening, I think at 10 p.m. on the National Geographic Channel in, in a couple weeks. Uh, so I'm going to show you just a, a little snippet from that uh, documentary that uh, d uh, is, is about this uh, trip in by helicopter. On one of these ridges is a field camp Tim and Ed will call home for the next three weeks. If they can land. So Rory, we're just looking for a, a cut clearing on a, on a ridge. Ed? Hopefully they pick up a helipad for us. Yeah. It is the moment of truth. Yeah, really. Yeah. Oh, let's hope, let's hope. I see smoke good ahead on the ridge, right there. You can see the bamboo there. It is. What do you think, Roy? Yeah, no problem. Barely a challenge. That's what we like to hear. It's good to have a laid back Australian helicopter pilot who just says, barely a challenge. Yeah. After only a sat phone call away and a few thousand dollars. <laughs> so we actually got dropped off in this uh, that very isolated ridge among in this beautiful forest, which was exactly the habitat of the Wands Parodia that we were especially after on this trip. And we went to the, the same field camp where uh, Bruce and some of his team had worked before, so we were able to, to use their sort of framework and set up uh, our tarps over it and make this our base camp for a couple of weeks while we while we searched for and tried to, to film the birds there. Our local helpers, uh, of course, started a fire immediately upon arrival. And this is actually you know, up in the mountains. It's quite cool up there. And so even though you think you know, you're in the tropical rainforest, uh, you're out there getting damp and wet, and you come back in the evening, and it's actually quite uh, welcoming to have a fire to huddle around and, and dry out and eat some warm food. This was the, the reason why we were there. This is the male Wands of Parodia. <clears throat> all Parodias have this incredible, all male Parodias have this uh, amazing uh, iridescent breast patch. And you'll notice they also have these little feathers coming out from the back of his head, sort of like the King of Saxony, but they're smaller. They have three behind each eye, and they have little flag tips on the end. Um, this species also has the, a long tail, which is unusual compared to the others. And every male Parodia does this for his courtship display. He displays on the ground. Uh, this is the reason I chose to study them for my graduate research, because I could find them on the ground. And they clear out this patch of forest. If you look there, you can see that there's no leaves. All the forest debris has been removed. Even all the small saplings have been pulled out and pruned of their leaves. And so it stands out. It's a very open and visible area in the forest. And you can hear the birds calling and go find it. But importantly, every parodia court, the male chooses a spot that has at least one horizontal branch running across it. You can, you can see it there. There's a white one that's a root on the ground, but there's another horizontal branch above it. And for all the years I was doing research studying parodia behavior, and that Tim and I were documenting uh, all five species in the genus, we did this. We moved really fast. No, we, uh, <laughs> we, we, we built a blind out of forest materials, uh, maybe five feet away, six feet away from the display court on the ground. You can see where Tim's face is sticking out there. That's where we put the cameras, and we sit there for hours, and we document what they do. And on the court, this is what the male parodia does. 
This is what he looks like. This is the quintessential male parodia display. We call it the ballerina dance or the ballerina display because it looks like he's wearing a skirt or a tutu. Well, just like those other shape-shifting, transforming birds of paradise we see, and those aren't his wings. Those are specialized feathers that evolved only for making this courtship shape, and he's lifted them and wrapped them around his body, and he dances around on the ground shaking his head wires. Well, what's interesting is that this is the view that we've always studied, and this is how all the behaviors have been described and named and analyzed, but this isn't the view that the female Parodia sees. Remember, she sits on that horizontal perch above him, looking down. And so we had this, this question about <clears throat> what would it look like to see this display from the perspective of the female? What is the context that this display actually evolved in? So here we're going to, this is not the Wands' Parodia that we're looking at here, nor in that previous slide. This is the Western Parodia, which is a close relative. It gives you a sense of what this behavior looks like from the ground perspective that we've always studied it. And you can see this ballerina dance going on. You can see where the female is on that horizontal branch. You can see the cleared court. But he did a bow there. He comes out with his skirt around him, and he's walking in this ritualized way. He's going to pause right underneath the female. Got those head wires out. <clears throat> and then he's going to move on into another component of that display, which we'll look at in a second. Here's the female, Wands' Parodia. You can see she's actually quite beautiful herself, has a long tail kind of like the male. We're back to our expedition species here. And so this is all about a bizarre behavior of seeing this display from the female's perspective. Yeah, for years, Ed and I had this idea to try to get a camera up above looking down. Uh, we tried a couple other you know, attempts at this early on, but never had success with either you know, basically getting it to work or getting the male to, to tolerate the camera there. But this time, we decided to make an all-out effort, and we were helped by some of the advances in camera technology. And so what we did this time in the Sunbaum area, once we found this good court that had a tree next to it, we set up a blind in the front, like you see with a, where the big camera is set up on the lower right to get that standard front view. We set up a second camera off to the side to shoot kind of a wider view of the whole court. And then I rigged up a third camera up above on the, on the tree trunk looking down. We just built a ladder out of uh, bamboo from the forest, and I climbed up and attached this, this camera very well camouflaged and, and hidden there uh, that had this perspective looking down. And from that camera, cables were run back to the blind where Ed and I worked together. Now, normally we work in, you know, we're working on different blinds. I might be shooting in one place and Ed's shooting in another blind. This time we, we teamed up to control these three cameras. And so I controlled the, 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 the front view camera while Ed from the laptop controlled two, the other two cameras which were connected by cables back to our little, uh, little blind there, and you can see on his screen the view from that, that top-down camera. So now we're going to see what the <clears throat> ballerina display looks like on the male wands' parodia. There he does his bow. Now this is just a practice display. There's no female there. Males spend hours and hours practicing for the time that a female does show up. You see he comes out, he's waggling his head, he's doing the walking phase, and then he pauses right there under where the female would be, this exaggerated twitch, and then he plunges his head down and he does this waggle back and forth, and we can see the the iridescence on his breast shield as he's moving it back and forth and those head wires moving around. So what is this going to look like from the female's perspective? Here's the camera looking down. There's a female showing up for on cue this time. The male comes out. It's kind of a darker clip here, but you can see the shape of the display looks fundamentally different from the way that it does on the ground. And this is the context in which it evolved. This is where the females are selecting these males. In fact, had we seen this display from the female's perspective originally, we probably wouldn't have called it the ballerina dance display at all, right? That's the human perspective. We probably would have called this the wobbling ovoid display or something like that. <laughs> so let's take a look again at an instance. It's a practice display, but with better light. And there's two of the cameras, the wide view on the side and the female camera looking down, and they're synced. So you can kind of see what's going on from two perspectives. And really pay attention to the one on the left and see what happens when he goes into that waggle phase. He plunges his neck down. And you see this incredible flash of, of iridescent yellow this time, not green, uh, when he pulls his head down before he goes into that waggle. And that flash, it's frozen here, is clearly being directed directly up to where that female is perching and looking down. And all the times that we had looked at that view over there, we never thought that that, that, that motion was important for the female's view at all. We thought it was all about the head waggling. But there was something that was even a bigger discovery that really surprised us. I don't know if you 
<clears throat> notice there, but in addition to something going on on this front, there's actually something going on in the back of his head. All male parodias have this incredible, almost mirror-like reflector, iridescent patch of feathers on the back of their head. <clears throat> and in all the years of studying them, even holding specimens, holding live birds, and no idea what this feather ornament was for and how it was used. Well, it turns out that only when you're looking at this display from the female's perspective can you see how it's used. It's basically a, a reflector tracing the motion of his head back and forth because the male's skirt is so dark and the top of his head is so dark, the female couldn't really see up much of that waggling. And so it seems like this is helping her uh, distinguish that motion. And so we were shocked to find that. Yeah, sort of appreciating that for the first time really gave a whole new meaning to what this head waggle was all about. So here's a photographic summary of the whole thing coming together. The, the different camera perspectives, the moment before the flash of the colors and those two ornaments being projected up to the female. So fortunately we had good weather and our helicopter pilot was able to come back. We were there working on that for uh, two weeks before we finally got the, uh, the images that we needed uh, to say we got the female's perspective and the weather had been rainy and terrible almost the whole time. So it was a huge relief to have this beautiful morning. And we had to pack up our gear this time to the helicopter that's always running. They never shut off their helicopters in a remote area like this, unless it doesn't come back on. Uh, and we are off to the, to, the, to the next part of the expedition. And this brings us to part three, Extraordinary Beauty. <clears throat> so to orient you here, back to the, to the map of New Guinea, I want to look, focus on those islands, uh, kind of amoeba-shaped islands up on the upper left. The big one there is the island of Halmahera. <clears throat> but over here is, are two little islands, Ternate and Tidore, that actually don't have birds of paradise. And this is <clears throat> a little bit of a uh, historical sidebar, if you will, before we get to our actual expedition. Those islands are the legendary Spice Islands. There's Ternate there. You might have heard of them. Uh, some famous uh, explorer by the name of Ferdinand Magellan, uh, he was looking for an alternative route um, to go around the world in order to get to the Spice Islands uh, and, and to establish trade with Spain, because the Portuguese were already working there. This is the Portuguese fort where Tim took this photograph on the island of Ternate, looking over at Tidore. And this is the bay where they parked the two remaining ships of the, of the circumnavigation of the globe. Uh, at this point, uh, Magellan was actually dead. He was killed by natives in the Philippines. But when they got here, they were filling the cargo holds with nutmeg and clove and all these things that were the most valuable things in the world at the time, which is why they were there, to take them back to Europe. And the kings, the sultans of these various islands who were at the center of the world commerce at the time, they also wanted to establish their role with the kings of Europe. And so they wanted to give something that was the most valuable thing that they could think of as gifts to the king of Spain. And one of the sultans from one of the other smaller islands who has a domain that expands out uh, further to the south and to the east, <clears throat> he gave a gift of, a, of several incredibly plumed birds, unlike anything that anybody had ever seen before. They had these extraordinary feathers uh, that were um, otherworldly. And uh, interestingly, at the time, they were prepared in a, in a way by the local New Guineans where they cut off their feet and they cut off their wings. And so when these went back to Europe, they caused a tremendous sensation. And the, the crew members of Magellan's fleet even took them and presented them to the Pope. Um, and at the time when they were in Rome, people who were there on their pilgrimages to working on their, on their stories of inspiration, uh, these were actually illustrated in the uh, 17th century or excuse me, the 16th century, um, in, this, in various forms. This one's actually in a prayer book. And this bird is probably one of the ones that came from Medellin's voyage, the one that's depicted here. And it has no feet, it has no wings. It's just this body of incredible feathers and plumes. And to the, to the minds of the people at the time, they couldn't explain this. These, were, these birds were unlike anything anybody had ever seen. They don't have wings, they can't fly. So they must be birds from an earthly uh, paradise, the, the garden, the literal garden of Eden that people were searching. And that's how the birds of paradise got their name. By a couple hundred years later, uh, in the time of uh, Alfred Russell Wallace's explorations of the, the Malay Archipelago in the 1750s, uh, you know, a lot, bit more was known about Birds of Paradise. The European naturalists knew that they actually did have feet and wings, but uh, nobody had actually seen them displaying in the wild. And in this uh, classic uh, work, work, work of natural history, uh, Wallace describes his voyages and explorations around what's now the Indonesian archipelago, and 
his uh, going to the Aru Islands to see and actually observe uh, greater birds of paradise displaying in the wild for the first time. And so Ed and I decided that we really wanted to sort of follow in Wallace's footsteps and uh, go to the same area where he had gone and, and first seen and described the greater birds of paradise. And we went, so, so we had to go to this remote group of islands called the Aru Islands uh, that you see there in the middle, to, which, which lie below the mainland of New Guinea uh, in, in a remote corner of Indonesia that's, that's really off the beaten track. <coughs> we uh, traveled there uh, to this small town and then made our way by boat uh, past small villages like this one, which uh, probably don't look you know, much different than in Wallace's time, except for maybe a few uh, tin roofs here and there. So this is a, a time lapse that Tim set up, tracing our route on this small boat up one of these channels, which are actually saltwater channels. These islands are fractured by things that look like rivers, but they're actually saltwater or, or, or brackish water, a mix of fresh and, and salt. And we're, we're moving up with all of our gear, getting deeper and deeper into the forest, farther away from the from the villages trying to get to the area where we knew there was some of these greater birds of paradise. They had been scouted for us, uh, displaying in a, in, a, in, a, in a display tree there. Um, the birds are still hunted uh, in Aru Islands and they're still being exported on the same trade route that existed even in Magellan's day. Uh, so it was hard to find a, a healthy population with uh, plumed males. So we have all of our gear here. Everybody unloads everything because the big boat can't go any further. The water's too shallow. And then someone says, hey, wait a minute. This other boat can go a little bit farther up there. We don't want to carry this stuff any farther than we have to. So they, un they loaded the other boat back up just to get it a little farther up. But this is why we were there. These are the greater birds of paradise from the Aru Islands. So in this last section, I want to share with you uh, this sort of pursuit uh, that I undertook to, to photograph these birds in a, in a unique way. Uh, but I couldn't have done it without the help of the, the local uh, Kerry clan, men from the Kerry clan of this uh, uh, Wokom village, who were the landowners here. And uh, they willingly uh, allowed us to uh, come and, and take pictures in their land. They had actually come from a long tradition of bird of paradise hunting uh, for their plumes. Uh, but they had uh, decided to set aside some of their forest and stop hunting the birds in one area to, ho to hopefully start attracting some visitors. And we were basically the first visitors that uh, came and uh, I sort of, we sort of showed up, they took us out to the site and they said, well, this is the tree that, the, that they display in. It was clear that I was gonna have to get up in the canopy to photograph them. Uh, and you know, I have my own way of doing that. I've got my bow and arrow, I can shoot a line up, climb up a rope and make a little platform. And I, I explained to them, okay, well, I'll go up there and I'll make a blind with my camouflage cloth and everything. And they said, oh no, that won't work. If you use that stuff, the birds won't come. And uh, I said, well, really? They said, yes. They said, we have a way of doing this, and you have to do it properly. You have to use the right materials, and there's a very you know, specific way to build a blind for hunting birds of paradise, which, you know, photographing birds of paradise is basically the same thing, right? Uh, and so I decided to go along with the, their local, you know, traditional way of building blinds and said, okay, well, I'll go up there with you and watch you, but, you, you know, I'll let you, you know, that'd be great if you can help me build this blind. So they, they tied this, this uh, first they tied in two big poles to support the floor. They tied everything together using, using vines. Uh, no, they wouldn't let me use any rope or twine to tie it together. They, uh, they said that the floor would consist of 12 of these small poles uh, going across. And uh, I explained that, well, I was gonna need to bring up quite a bit of gear, set up a tripod up there and so on. And could I have a little bit bigger floor? You know, could this platform be a little bit bigger? And they said, no, uh, if, you, if you use more than 12 poles in the floor, the birds won't come. <laughs> so I said, okay, can you just please like space them out, leave some gaps between them so I have a little more area? And they said, yeah, we can do that. So that's why there are all those holes in the floor. <laughs> but they, they thatched the whole thing with these beautiful palm leaves and created this uh, really gorgeous blind up there in the treetops. And so... I used this, I climbed up there you know, in the dark every morning and spent, uh, spent many days uh, waiting for these birds to show up and they came most days in the early morning uh, and, I, and I started getting some really, really nice footage. This is a place where two males were generally coming to display together in what we call a lek. You 
see a couple of females there kind of coming in and out, taking a look. Notice that the males have these certain phases of the display where they kind of freeze so that the females can get a really close look at them. And there's a still image of the same, same frame. One other interesting uh, thing that the, the uh, Carey brothers told me that I had to do before I went up in the tree was they said that, uh, you know, it's very important before you climb up in the tree in the morning that you take some wax from your ear on your finger and that you rub it on the tree trunk before you climb up. And I said, okay, really? Uh, um, but, uh, you know, I was kind of going with the local traditions there. So in the morning before I went up, I, I did that. I rubbed a little earwax on the tree and I climbed up and came back to the camp the first day. And they said, well, did the birds come? And I said, yeah, they came. I got some great stuff. And they said, did you put the wax on the tree? And I said, yeah, I did. And they said, it worked. So, <laughs> so uh, it was really a great experience being able to get these close-up shots from that blind. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, these birds of paradise are, you know, such a great example of, of diversity. That's what got us so fascinated about this family. So we've talked about the diversity. Um, we've talked about the, the, sexual, the process of sexual selection that, that led to this uh, incredible uh, radiation and, and, you know, diversification of these different species. Uh, but, you know, across the ages, from the time of those, uh, those early uh, travelers who brought the specimens back to Europe and up to our time, you know, one of, of course, other aspect about the birds of paradise that really fascinates everybody is just purely their beauty. Uh, and that really motivated me, too, to just try to, to try to capture the, the most beautiful images I could of these birds in their habitat. And so one uh, sort of dream that I had from the beginning of this project is to not just get close-up shots, but to try to capture the bird, you know, in their environment, to try to get that my, sort of a dream shot I had was to was to capture the bird with the landscape behind. And I, after spending a few days up in that blind, watching what the birds were doing and, and seeing uh, the perspective I could get from possibly from their tree, I decided that this might be the spot where I could actually climb up into the same tree where they were displaying and mount a camera there. And so here's a little video uh, that shows I'm how I look, did that. I'm in the left tree right now. So I've got a little camera mounted on my head as I climb up into the top of this a tree. All right. There now, here's the lek right here. See these branches right here? This is the main display perch and the secondary perch there. And there's my blind over there where I've been shooting from. And right here. So right there, in, that, uh, in those, those leaves, I had hidden this camera. See, inside we have a Canon 7D microphone, pocket wizard, the whole setup. I'm going to take a shot of it here with my other camera. I just want to point out, this is a guy with a camera on his head, pulling out a camera to take a picture of a camera that's taking pictures of birds. And uh, this is the kind of thing that happens to you when you work with a National Geographic photographer, and that's the only place that that happens. Well, it turned out that although, yes, it may have seemed a little bit silly at times, what I was doing up there, uh, this system actually did work. And uh, I, the birds accepted this sort of clump of leaves there and didn't really seem to notice the lens in the front of it. And uh, by climbing up during the night, I actually set this up in the dark uh, because I had to do it when the birds weren't around. And I ran a cable from this tree over to the other tree where my blind was. And so then on, every time I wanted to use it, use every, every day I wanted to use this, I, I climbed up. I went about 4 o'clock out to the forest, climbed up the tree, mounted the camera, connected the cables up, went down to the ground, back over to the other tree, climbed up the other tree uh, into my blind, carrying my laptop in a case, Connected the, connected the cables up to the laptop, you know, and just hoped that everything was working. Uh, and there you can see that that morning it was working. The, uh, the laptop is showing the image from the camera over the leaf cam over on the other tree. And as it started to get light, uh, I started shooting some video because the mail started arriving. <coughs>
few minutes later, uh, one of those females that you saw coming in actually gave the signal that she was interested in going on to the next phase of the display, which is where the male comes in and starts tapping on her neck and making this kind of crazy vocalization here. The males only make that sound prior to mating. This is the pre-mating display. So if you're a male greater bird of paradise, your day doesn't start any better than that. <laughs> so it was just a few moments later, uh, as I watched this scene, the sun popped out from behind the clouds. And I realized that all of a sudden, the light was perfect. And the sort of dream shot that I'd imagined had materialized before me. And so I clicked the shutter and, and got that shot. Thank you.